The evolutionary history of man that we see so typically represented in our history textbooks simply does not fit the picture of the evidence that we find in archaeology. With the possible exception of the last hundred years, maybe 200, the further back we go in history, the more advanced the technology and the more sophisticated the evidence indicates the people were. That's not the picture you see in the textbook, but what we see from the facts. And in fact, that is so obvious and so clearly demonstrated that I think maybe we ought to change the histories rather than try to juggle the facts. We find this kind of documentation and acknowledgement even from those who are humanist, who are evolutionist. That would certainly be the case with William Prescott. And in his book, The Conquest of Peru, he makes this point on a number of occasions. <clears throat> now, he is not a creationist by any means, but he is acknowledging evidence that I believe certainly sustains or supports the concept of creation, a recent creation. He says, for example, the memorials of the past remains of temples, aqueducts, other public works, which whatever degree of science they may display in their execution, astonish by their number, the massive character of the materials, the grandeur of their design. Now this is a statement that describes literally dozens of places throughout South America that, that demonstrate amazing technology as well as the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, which uh, of course evolutionists cannot tolerate. Most of the work that we'll be looking at today <clears throat> is in the area of Peru and Bolivia. Our work was done in Peru, primarily in the area of Inca, uh, near the Paracas Peninsula, uh, in Nazca, in that area. And we see here the scenic Pan American Highway as it travels through this area. <clears throat> it is the most desolate area you could ever imagine. It hasn't rained there for a hundred years. You can't find a blade of grass. <laughs> Uh, for just on and on and on. It's amazing. And that desolation continues right on out to the coast. And this is an area that uh, we were interested in initially. Uh, and we'll talk more about a boulder that fell off of that cliff down to the beach. But as we walked along the beach, we saw about the only thing we saw were the pelicans, which I think are, are somewhat symbolic of, of desolation. Uh, where there's no rain and it's just dryness and desert. We see pictured here uh, Dr. Uh, Javier Cabrera, who was 20 years head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Lima, with his hand behind a fossil skull embedded in a tertiary boulder with a modern skull in the foreground for scale. Now being head of the Department of Medicine, he knows what a human skull looks like. Uh, he brought that there for comparison and brought this to our attention. He says, in this tertiary boulder, which is uh, very close to, that's the next layer above the dinosaurs, uh, some 60 million years ago, we've got a human skull. Uh, well, we came down to investigate that, and by the time we had gotten there, uh, it had been sabotaged. Actually, he had made some comments to reporters. They had mentioned it in the newspaper and someone destroyed it. And here you can see the hole where that skull was. It was bashed and completely removed. We did investigate some interesting phenomenon <clears throat> in association with this, layering with uh, what we would call seashells, the philosopods, uh, that were closed and buried alive. We made a presentation to, uh, on this at the GSA, Geological Society of American Convention, uh, about 5,000 geologists showing evidence for the rapid formation of this layer based on the buried alive 
uh, clams and seashells, so to speak. We went on to talk with Dr. Cabrera, who is a very interesting person who <clears throat> has some uh, different ideas, we'll say, uh, uh, some that I certainly would not uh, concur in. Uh, but he has, is a scientist. He is uh, very conscientious in his interpretation of some of this evidence. And he's seen pictured here in his mansion in Inca. He retired to be cultural anthropologist of Inca. His father had begun collecting burial stones from the Inca tombs back in the 30s. And after his death, he continued to collect these burial stones as well as artifacts from the tombs. They appear to be connected primarily with the Nazca culture. Uh, many are familiar with the Nazca lines, which were carved in the desert, <clears throat> depicting perhaps some of the gods that they worshiped in that ancient time, but they're huge sculptures in the desert floor. On these burial stones, you see figures of the monkey and the hummingbird, for example, and the tail of the monkey up above him there seen in the, the circular form that are certainly similar to these carvings on the, on the desert floor, which uh, are amazing in that they cover uh, sometimes, uh, well, hundreds of yards up to half a mile in dimension, and you can't see them from the desert floor. You have to be up in the air. These pictures we took as we were flying over in a, in a rented Cessna, uh, and there you can see the same style monkey with that circular tail. You can see in this picture uh, the hummingbird, uh, there on the right-hand side of the picture, here a spider. But these are huge in dimension, hundreds of yards that are visible only from the air. I think they were worshiping these things uh, as representations of the gods which they thought lived in the air, and they made them big enough for them to see them. But it was an amazing technological achievement to be able to do that. Several university uh, grad students have tried to reproduce that and found it impossible. Uh, one interesting figure that uh, Eric von Donegan had featured uh, interpreting this as uh, an astronaut. And so here we have the astronaut who's waving at us. And notice his head uh, with the, the space helmet on. Well, further investigation made nonsense out of that interpretation. Uh, this is what we actually see when we can investigate uh, <clears throat> with infrared and uh, with other technology that shows the form even better. He has a fish under his elbow on a stringer. He has a net in the other hand. And looking back at that again, yes, you can see under his elbow the, the fish and the net. But infrared reveals that in uh, unmistakable detail. This is not an astronaut, but this is a fisherman <clears throat> and maybe waving to a fish god, I'm not sure. Uh, but how did they do this? Well, it would take sophisticated mathematics to do some of those figures, but it would take more than that. And one of the things that we've learned is that these people used hot air balloons. They flew. Now, that's astounding when we're talking about probably two to 3,000 years ago. Uh, there are various dates, but uh, probably, uh, well, at least 2,000. Uh, 2,500 is, is a generally accepted date. Notice the statement here by Jim Woodman in his book, <clears throat> What Contiki Uncovered About Man's Mastery of the Sea, Nazca Now Reveals About Man's Conquest of the Air. <clears throat> now, Contiki was the reproduction of these reed boats, which they made and then sailed from South America all the way to Australia to show that they were seaworthy and that these myths, some had called them, uh, were actually rooted in fact and could actually be repeated. He did that. Well, what Contiki showed about man's mastery of the sea, he says now is repeated. Uh, men flew 2,000 years ago, and they have found the uh, description of these and recreated them. They actually recreate the flying machines that ascended from Nazca's desert floor long ago, and he concludes these were men of stunning sophistication and intelligence. And yes, they did reproduce this. They made some and flew them just as the people from Nazca did. And from the air, they could see and direct uh, the, the manufacture of these huge features. But this is the culture that the stones are connected with. <clears throat> they worshiped heavenly bodies. 
they measured the movement of the heavenly bodies in a very sophisticated manner and produced a calendar that is absolutely stunning, as was the case with other cultures in South America. Here again from uh, Hancock's book describing their calendar, strangely enough, its origins wrapped in the mist of antiquity far deeper than the 16th century. The Mayan, Mayan calendar achieved an even greater accuracy. It calculated the solar year at uh, 365.2420 days, a minus area uh, era of 0 0.20002 of a day, much, much more sophisticated than our calendars today. Uh, these obviously were not dummies and measured the movement of heavenly bodies with incredible sophistication. When we look at what's depicted on the stones, we see what appears to be brain surgery seen here. Uh, in great detail, we know of the terplanning, uh, the uh, mysterious uh, holes drilled in the skull, which uh, almost all show evidence of healing. Uh, they did it very well. Uh, but this appears to depict something more sophisticated than that. We have found a number of skulls that had been operated on, if you please, with brain surgery, and almost all of them show significant healing, showing they survived the surgery and continued to heal. Here, almost completely healed over. Uh, these, again, were not dummies that were dragging their mate by the hair of the head and club in the other hand. These were uh, uh, men with sophisticated intelligence. Here they seem to be performing a cesarean surgery. One of the things that we see depicted on these stones that uh, is not that impressive to me, maybe to some, is that uh, about a third of them are some of the most disgusting pornography uh, that you could ever imagine. This is as close as I'll get to showing it to you, but it's a book that depicts this and we have museums devoted just to uh, this kind of this pornographic uh, uh, depiction from uh, burial stones and from uh, ceramic figurines from uh, uh, their drinking vessels uh, from vases and so forth uh, that shows the kind of culture that existed at that time it was a disgusting culture though it was very uh, prosperous and wealthy, and uh, uh, they, they had slaves, they had lots of gold, and they lived very well. They were amazing engineers. We're looking here at a water channel that was designed to bring water from the Andes uh, over uh, well, about 150 miles, and it's underground, about 50 feet underground most of the way, through very uh, amazingly sophisticated channels here surfacing so that people would have access to the water along the way. Most of the access is gained through these spiral accesses where you go down to the level where the water was and uh, you have seven of these spiral accesses in one of the major cities there. And so it continued to take the water along the way 50 feet underground and the people could go down and get the water and then come back. Notice the description of the engineering involved in industrial research and development. Uh, the hydraulic simulation showed that the Chimu channels were completely modern in design. They relied on concepts of fluid dynamics that, were West, that Western hydrologists only started to apply in the past century, again, before the time of Christ. But what's really interesting about these burial stones collected by Cabrera and a number of others uh, is the fact that they depict dinosaurs. Here is one of the large stones here in the center of uh, a room he has built for displaying this in the front of his 300-year-old mansion. He is a descendant of the conquistadors. This is one of the castles they built, and he lives in it. And of course, he's, he, was, uh, he passed away in 2002. But looking closely at uh, this stone, you can see the very obvious dinosaur with the dermal frills on its back, a man sitting atop fighting evidently. And then we look at the top of the stone and we see it's ornately covered with, uh, with carvings and uh, a closer view. You see the upper right hand corner, the very obvious sauropod dinosaur with the, the man in his mouth dangling by the foot. Uh, beautifully and artistically done in stone. But there are thousands of these, some 11,000 burial stones have been collected by the Cabreras 
Uh, about a third of them are this disgusting pornography, and then about a third of them are of dinosaurs. Uh, here we see most, uh, many of them are shown with man associated, but uh, in battle. Here he's chopping the neck. Uh, in this one, he's already chopped the neck and holding the head in his hand of possibly a juvenile form, but then looks like mama has got him <laughs> from behind or at least another younger one attacking him and, uh, together with a much larger one on the same stone. Uh, another one here is being bitten as he rides on the back. Uh, notice the variety in styles. This is rather oriental in style. Uh, very different, but uh, obviously very similar. This one's very, uh, you know, maybe literalistic, if you please. Uh, some almost cartoonish. Another oriental style dinosaur. Uh, this beautiful stone is almost four feet tall. Uh, again, very artistically done with the dermal frills on the back, which were written up for the first time in Geology Magazine in uh, 1992. Um, when Mr. Sinclair depicted his dinosaur on the Sinclair dinosaur sign. He didn't know it had dermal frills on the back, but they did down in, uh, in Peru uh, over 2,000 years ago, and uh, here we see them depicted on the stones. It looks like a scene maybe out of Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, no question about the species that's depicted here. Uh, some rather artistically and stylistically done uh, cartoonish and uh, then very literal. Uh, here are a number of different species depicted on the same stone. Uh, again, a tremendous variety is obvious. One person, again, did not do this. But this is not the only museum that depicts uh, dinosaurs on the burial stones. Another very interesting display of these stones is seen in the museum there in Inca was actually established by Dr. Cabrera over 20 years ago. They have a collection, but they will not display it. We had talked to the brother of Carlos Solti, uh, Pablos, who had donated the collection to the museum uh, uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, we had seen pictures of the stones that he had donated. His brother had excavated them in the 50s, uh, near the village of Okakehi, and uh, then donated this to the museum upon the death of his brother. Uh, we went there, said, we want to see this collection. They said, it doesn't exist, that's a myth. We said, we've seen the pictures, we've talked to the one who donated the collection. They said, well, yes, okay, it does exist, but they're in storage and you can't see them. We insisted, saying this is a museum that's not supposed to hide things, it's supposed to show things. They said, well, you can't do this unless you're authorized by an official museum with 48 hours notice. We said, we think we can handle that, and we did. We got a letter from an official state authorized museum authorizing us to examine them. With 48 hours notice, we came back. They still refused. They said, you will not be allowed to examine these. They were stonewalling. Uh, Dr. Swift eventually did gain access last year and got pictures, and yes, they are virtually, well, they are the same as the ones that we see in the Ewell's Rudd collection uh, with dinosaurs on them. Uh, we did get to examine the ones in the collection at the Aeronautical Museum in Lima, pictured here. Uh, years ago, there were many more. They have disappeared over the years. Uh, there were several hundred initially. There are about 40 that remain. But here we see one on the floor in the room where they are displayed, and uh, these are the poorer ones. The better ones have disappeared, but you can still see uh, the dinosaurs on the stones displayed in the Aeronautical Museum uh, in Lima. In the museum in Nazca, likewise, they have some of the carved stones on display. And here we see uh, Dr. Swift <laughs> laboring as he holds up one of the stones for the camera. The stones are exhibited in the Cabrera Museum, where there are 11,000 of them, in the Museum of Inca, where they're hidden, and uh, they wouldn't allow us to see them. Uh, Dr. Swift did eventually get and Then the Nazca Museum, and the Aeronautical Museum, and the Naval Museum. But we see here the museums which have these stones, all but one of them have them on display that can be seen today. We traveled to the village of Okakehi, where 
a number of these stones, or at least in the area, where a number of these stones had been excavated in the 50s uh, by Carlos Solti, uh, who, is, um, the, who was the rector of the uh, College of Engineers in Lima. And uh, there we see an obviously very depressed area. Uh, we see individuals who are just eking out a living. Um, Basilio Achua is one of the individuals here who has found a number of these stones and had taken them to Dr. Cabrera. Uh, he took us out to the place where many had been excavated and we could see the actual tombs and see some of the stones in the tombs. As we walked along this desolate area, you could see the bones that had been strewn along the way by the grave robbers who weren't interested in the bones at all, but in the artifacts that they could dig out to sell. Uh, in these tombs, you see amazing preservation, even of flesh parts. Uh, in an area where it hasn't rained for 100 years, uh, the dryness of the desert is excellent for preservation. But in these tombs, you can see the remains of the mummies. This is a trophy head that was worn on the belt by this brutal culture. In one of the nearby museums, you see the skulls with a hole in the head. This means that was a, a trophy head. It had been worn by somebody who had evidently killed them in battle. But as we look at these tombs, we see often babies with mothers. Maybe if the mother died, they couldn't take care of the babies. And uh, I, I don't know the whole story, but it doesn't look like a, a nice story. Uh, here we see one of the well-preserved mummies together with a number of bones that have been found in the area. And in this particular tomb, you see one of the burial stones in C2 in place. And you see this uh, on a number of occasions. Here's another one of the burial stones beside one of the mummies uh, with a dinosaur on it. This one was excavated in 2005. The drawing here shows what's seen on it, not as uh, dramatically clear as with some of them, but it can be seen very clearly. It has been examined carefully by a number of laboratories, and we see the close-up of some of the carvings showing the patina uh, in the grooves, also testifying to its antiquity. Uh, this was one that was excavated in 2006 that uh, is in a collection that I own. This is about a 70-pound stone. It has three dinosaurs on it was from about 100 miles away from the Paracas Peninsula. And uh, the carving style is slightly different. You can see uh, the teeth are raised uh, rather than incised. Uh, the bias relief is in evidence here, but the same style, uh, again, depicting the dinosaurs. Many say, well, Cabrera uh, was a strange fellow, and we can't depend on his testimony. Well, uh, I think he was a very credible witness, but we have many, many different sources. Notice that the first one is the Spanish priest uh, who in 1525 described these stones, and there have been several reports of this. The chronicler of the Incas wrote of these stones in 1570. Uh, in detail, they found the stones with the strange animals on them. And then uh, uh, Bolivia Cabrera, the grandfather, of uh, the one that we worked with there, began collecting the stones in the 30s, and then Javier Cabrera continued the collection, uh, amassing some 11,000 of the stones. He was professor of medicine at the University of Lima, head of the Department of Medicine for 20 years. He established the largest teaching hospital in Peru and retired to be cultural anthropologist for Inca. This is not a lightweight in terms of a witness. But if you want to ignore him, there are many others. There's Carlos Solti, who excavated the stones at Okokehi in the 50s. Uh, Pablo Solti, who is his brother, donated the stones to the museum in 1968. The museum denied it, promised to show them to us if we met their conditions, and then refused, but then finally did reveal them. Yes, they have them there. And then Basilio Achua of Okokehi excavated a number of the stones. The Aeronautical Museum displays many of the stones today, as does the Regional Museum in Nazca. Um, I, together with Dr. Swift, have observed them in the tombs in C2. University of Bonn uh, in Germany has confirmed the oxidized patina 
and a number of the stones and grave robbers continue to excavate these carved stones. You can still dig them up. Now that's an impressive array of confirmation. And if you don't like uh, Dr. Cabrera, then okay, <laughs> toss him out. You still have an impressive array of confirmation. In addition to the stones we find in the tombs, other things that display the dinosaurs, like the textiles, the burial cloths that were associated with them. Many of them show the dinosaur motif, as do the, the vases, uh, the pottery. This is in the National Museum in Lima, under it has a sign circa 2,500 years before present. Uh, and then the, the Moshi vases, very famous for their style, uh, inability to reproduce them. Uh, they're showing clearly dinosaurs. And then some of the gold death masks that were found up in northern Peru likewise show the dinosaurs. Notice the dermal frills on the back, the huge teeth, the tail curving up over their back on either side of the face here. Uh, it's obvious that the people of Peru were seeing dinosaurs from their vases and their death masks and their textiles as well as the thousands of stones that can be seen today. I, I think that's just really irrefutable evidence. Now, let's travel to Bolivia. Here we see the capital of Bolivia, La Paz, one of the highest cities in the world, and there is very interesting evidence here. The Amante Indians, as they're called, uh, are the natives that were here before the Spaniards arrived. And when we look at their traditions, uh, we look at the history uh, that they all are aware of, at least from their folklore. It's, it's uh, very interesting. They all know of the Viracosa, the sky god, the creator god, who sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And they were looking for the return of his son. They know about Tomas, the man with the book. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of Christians think that uh, yes, the, the gospel was preached to the whole world, but uh, they don't believe the whole world had the gospel preached to it. And uh, I think we see evidence that some of them came to this part of the country. Most of the Amante live up on the barren plain, the Altiplano, which is a huge plain uh, over 180 miles long and about 60 miles wide. Uh, that's almost 14,000 feet in the air. That thin air is very difficult to make a living in, but they do, uh, mostly growing potatoes uh, in very ingenious ways. Here's one of the Amante women who's returned from uh, about a 20 kilometer trek to go to the grocery store. Uh, it's a very difficult life. We talked with a number of them and each of them told us of the knowledge of uh, Veracosa, the sky god. Yes, they, they knew about that and many of them are uh, polygamous. They worship uh, idols and they make sacrifices to those idols. But they also know that in the past that wasn't the case and that there was the worship of the one true creator God in the past. We're reminded of Acts chapter 1 where Jesus told the apostles that you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria even to the remotest parts of the earth. I think we see evidence of that when we see Tomas, man of the book. There are statues, there are paintings of him uh, showing him in, in this long robe, the attire of the first century with the codex under his arm. Uh, evidently he came here and taught. Notice the statement by William Prescott who comments on the evidence for this. He's the atheist, the one who is certainly no creationist in his book Conquest of Peru. He says it's a remarkable fact that many, if not most, of the rude tribes inhabiting the vast American continent, however disfigured their creeds may have been in other respects by childish superstition, had attained to the sublime concep conception of the one great spirit, the creator of the universe. And now this, this is not many, he said, many if not most, had attained to this concept, the creator God, who was not to be dishonored at attempt at visual representation. He would not allow idolatry. But this is true in the backgrounds, he says, of most of the people of South America. And then he talks about some of the things uh, that they have in their culture. Among the traditions of importance is one of the deluge, which they held in common with so many nations in all parts of the globe. 
And then he says Orthodox Spaniards who first came to the country saw striking resemblance to Christian communion. They were practicing uh, probably a polluted form, but a form of the communion, which he goes on to say was evidence that some of the primitive teachers of the gospel, perhaps an apostle himself, had paid a visit to these distant regions and scattered over them the seeds of religious, or religious truth. Now, he would use truth in an accommodative sense because he's not a believer that this is the truth, but nevertheless sees evidence that there was an apostle here and that Christianity was planted here at an early time and that they were expecting the son of the creator God to come. I, I think this is interesting information from an atheist. We travel to Lake Titicaca, a very interesting area which straddles the border between Peru and Bolivia. Uh, here we see people who make a living often uh, weaving these uh, reed boats, some of them very large and uh, much larger than this, some of them, and uh, it's an amazing similarity that can be demonstrated between these boats and those that we find in Egypt made of exactly the same material, the same style. I think it's obvious that there was a connection here and Contiki helped to demonstrate that we mentioned earlier. Notice the, the description that we find here in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, Alan uh, Collada and his colleagues, University of Chicago, reproduced the irrigation technology practiced 1,500 years ago by the Tiwanaka people in test plots near day, uh, in modern day Bolivia's Lake Titicaca. The resulting bumper crops in some cases seven times the average yield of the land farmed using modern techniques. Now we think we know how to do things in a modern way today, but when he reproduced uh, what these dummies did, <laughs> he got seven times the produce than our modern techniques. They found if by osmosis they absorbed the water from beneath rather than just pouring the water on top, it worked much better. That was one of the things that they changed, but these again were no dummies. When we look at the history of the past, we see sophistication. When we go to the city, the ancient city of Tiwanaka, the ruins of it, we see tremendous sophistication indicated. Here in this huge gateway to the sun, this is carved from one huge uh, granite boulder uh, and transported over 200 kilometers. We know, we can see where they quarried it, where it came from. It was broken by an earthquake uh, about, a, well, just in, in recent modern times. Uh, how did they carve this? How did they transport this from 2,000 years ago? I'm standing here on some of the ruins of one of the temples and notice the huge nature of these stones and notice the surfaces. Uh, they're not close to perfect. <laughs> They are absolutely perfect, plain, flat. You want to try to do that yourself? Uh, this, this is an amazing accomplishment. And when you look at the specifics of the construction, notice that uh, where they join these rocks there, these staples that actually had uh, depressions carved in the rock, metal poured into it, and we find the metal staples in the nearby museum. Uh, this linked the stones together in a way that would help resist the earthquakes. And uh, what just blew my mind was that this was exactly the same type of feature that we find in the temples in Cambodia. Uh, we traveled there a uh, year before last and noticed those staples or, or metals that held the stones together there uh, where the fellow is holding the, the scale and then higher up above. We look at other examples <clears throat> from Cambodia. And now then we're back in Bolivia and we see the same type of construction, the mitered corners, uh, which were constructed to last for many, many years. We see great sophistication and then we see deterioration. <laughs> we see things going downhill and that's the general picture. This is, by the way, what we see in Egypt defining the devolved nature of the evidence. Here from Scientific American, the pyramid age had come to an end having lasted little more than a century. Pyramids were still being erected, but they rapidly became smaller and shoddier. They began uh, on the grandest scale and went downhill. That's the picture that we see 
in archaeology over and over again. One thing that was of great interest to me there at Tiwanaka was the tremendous range of ethnic faces that were depicted on the walls as well as in some of the figurines. There were, I think, very obvious Egyptian and Negroid and Oriental faces that we could see. Uh, we saw them in the sunken gardens, for example, there at Tiwanaka with this uh, uh, entrance gateway to the sun in the, in the background. Uh, these faces seem to be designed to depict a brotherhood of man, or at least a, a great range of ethnicity. Here the, the Negroid type is obvious, and many of them, of course, Oriental, and some strange faces that we can see here represented. Uh, some of them were, uh, I think, a very obvious Egyptian motif, as is the representation here. Uh, in some of the Acambaro figurines from Mexico, we pointed out there was the Oriental uh, here, here the Mexican motif, and then uh, very obvious oriental shapes. Some of them were African. Uh, again, the, the point is they traveled around the world a long time ago. And the idea that Columbus discovered America is ridiculous. Uh, here are these African figurines from over 2,000 years ago in the Acambaro collection, together with European, uh, show that uh, the various groups around the world were known. Here, uh, very obvious uh, African uh, forms. And then the Oriental, uh, very characteristic Oriental. By the way, this is the cue on the back of that head that we just saw that was broken from this statue. Um, the Olmec faces are very Oriental looking. That's been pointed out for a number of years, seen in the basaltic heads. Dr. Chu of the Dallas area, Texas Christian University, has documented this from a number of sources. First, the jade that's found there with the Olmecs is found only in China. And he says this is from the Chang Dynasty. Uh, he has evidence of it that has been reported in the standard journals. Here, ABC is reporting on it. Uh, Chu discovered jade, stone, and pottery artifacts attributed to the Olmec, believed to be ancestors of the Maya. The artistic motifs on the objects bear an extraordinary resemblance to the Chinese bone inscriptions from the Chang Dynasty of about 1600 to 1100 BC. Symbols for agriculture, astronomy, rain, religion, sacrifice, all of these were nearly identical. The, the language, the symbols, here's the ear treatment from uh, the Chang Dynasty and from the Olmecs. Uh, again, now from Discover Magazine, 3,000 years before the egg roll joined America's fast food menu, a group of Chinese immigrants may have sailed to the New World. Well, 3,000 years ago, Chinese came to America. What happened to uh, Columbus? That's uh, kind of old hat at this point. He has proof in their own handwriting, and he shows examples. Here we see the symbols for divine uh, in the Olmec, in the Chang, and then modern you know, for temple and uh, for container and for worship. Uh, for small, uh, it's absolutely identical. For offer, again, the language, the alphabet is identical. This came from China some 3,000 years ago and has readily been acknowledged now. Even the Japan Times, uh, notice here from August 1999 from Beijing, uh, the evidence showing similarities between the ancient native markings in Central America and ancient Chinese characters has added fuel to the theories that Chinese arrived in America as early as 3,000 years ago, uh, as Chinese state press reported Thursday. Uh, they were not dummies. They traveled around the world long, long before Columbus arrived here. Now, we travel back to Peru, this time to Cusco, where we see amazing sophistication likewise demonstrated. Uh, down south of Lima, uh, up in the highlands, we see stones uh, that were cut with amazing sophistication. Here is a, a stone fortress, and it's not in the style that we use where there is a, a, a row upon row upon row where there is a line between the stones which, of course, uh, the cracks follow if uh, there's a shift in the foundation. The, in this area with earthquakes, they had shifts in foundations, and so they, 
made irregular stones cut uh, just incredibly. And this is granite. This is as hard as it gets. And the, uh, the way they cut these stones is just absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, obviously, not something that I would know how to do. And notice the stone in the center here. This has 12 different angles, and it fits into the angles of the stone around it perfectly. And when you remove the stones around it, you see even the little imperfections in one stone match the imperfections in the other. It's just an incredible match. No need for mortar. They fit perfectly and, of course, resist uh, the earthquakes. These, again, were not dummies. Notice the statement that we find from uh, Mr. Nuremberg. What's truly impossible about the block, and he's talking about the largest block that they found here, again, cut with angles all around it, is this, it is the size of a five-story house and weighs an estimated 20,000 tons. Now, this came from 200 kilometers away. We have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it any distance. Now, that may uh, have some uh, people that would argue, but that's, that's at least close to so. Shows their mastery of technology, certainly, which we have not attained as yet. Uh, again, not dummies, but the further back you go, the more sophisticated you get. Just amazing sophistication. Now. Let's sum this up and raise some questions. Why is it that we see <laughs> just this uh, incredibly depressed, terribly poor area today? This, this is what's left of the incredibly sophisticated, very wealthy, prosperous society in the past. In fact, they, they really make a living off of the ancient society today. About the best living is, is grave robbing. Why? Is it like this, and why was it so different in the past? Well, I'd like to suggest an idea. It was because of their pornography, because of their cruelty, because of their wickedness. Now, would that cause the people, the land to become desolate? Well, I know God has done this in the past because he said so. In Ezekiel chapter 30, we read, Thus says the Lord, who shall, uh, th those who uphold Egypt shall fall. Now, Egypt had become cruel, very idolatrous. They had mistreated God's people. And Ezekiel prophesied, the pride of her power shall come down from uh, mid, mid all to Cyrene. Those within her shall fall by the sword, says the Lord. And he continues saying, they shall be desolate in the midst of the desolate countries and her cities shall be in the midst of cities that are laid waste. Could you find a better description of Egypt? Now, when you look in Genesis, Egypt was, was like the Garden of Eden. It fed the world in Joseph's time, but here it's desolate in the midst of countries that are desolate. Uh, God turned their water off and said that he would, and then now we see that is exactly what happened. Notice back in Genesis chapter 13, Lot lifted up his eyes, seeth a whole circuit of the Jordan that's all uh, an, a watered country before Jehovah's destroying of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, as Jehovah's garden, as the land of Egypt. The land of Egypt was a watered country. Today, that's not the way it looks, is it? And similarly, notice from uh, Zach, uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, he will stretch out his hand to the north and destroy Assyria, uh, another country that ruled the world in Bible times. Make Nineveh a desolation, the site of one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens. But he says, I'm going to make Nineveh as dry as the wilderness. And he continues describing what's going to happen. Uh, the herd shall lie down in the midst, the beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern shall lodge in the capitals here, the symbols of desolation, interestingly referring to the pelican. Their voice shall sing in the windows, desolation shall be at the threshold. Well, of course, this is the area of Iraq today, and we look to that area, and you couldn't find a more obvious depiction of desolation. Here, the pelican uh, is specifically referred to in verse 11, and the porcupine shall possess it. The oil and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch out over it the lines of confusion and the stones of emptiness. 
Well, that's exactly what we see in Peru. Do we think God can't see across the ocean? He rules the nations, not just those associated with Israel. And he saw a wicked nation, and it was a prosperous nation at that time, but it is not today. You remember Solomon said that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people, and God judges accordingly. Again, from Revelation chapter 19, we're told very plainly that the Messiah would rule and smite the nations. He would rule them with a rod of iron. We believe in the Messiah. Do we believe he's ruling the nations with a rod of iron? Well, I think we see abundant evidence that that's true. Conclusions that we can draw from this will illustrate this way. First, evolutionary history is wrong. We see incredible sophistication in the past. We see degeneration from that sophistication. We see that dinosaurs and man did coexist, and we see abundant evidence of that coexistence from their pottery and from the stones and from the textiles and from the death masks, also evidencing the fact that evolutionary history is wrong. We see the gospel was preached in all creation. They knew Tomas, the man of the book. We see evidence that travel took place 3,000 years ago around the globe, not just recently. And we see that, I believe, the Messiah judges nations. We see the stones of emptiness. We see the desolation that comes when righteousness does not exalt a nation, but when sin is a reproach and brings embarrassment and judgment by the Messiah. These conclusions, I think, are obvious when we look at history, and I think we need to take them to heart.